Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Talis is going to volunteer to do our land acknowledgement this morning, and Smitty is going to do it on Wednesday. So thank you so much. I know it's kind of last minute, but we wanted to just share facilitation with you all now that you've seen us do it over a series of um, of days. So I'm going to turn it over to Talis, and then we will do um, spend the morning talking about legal advocacy. Go ahead, Talis. All right, hi everyone, good morning. Um, all right, so today we acknowledge we occupy and benefit from the lands of the Coast Salish people whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. A people still here continuing their practice, traditions, cultures, and languages. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the original and current indigenous inhabitants of this shared land that we work and live on. Tell us, thank you so much, appreciate that. And you can put in the chat as well, uh, kind of the land that you're coming from today. I'm over here on the Squally land today. Yeah, today I am here in Mount Vernon. Uh, well, what is known as present day Mount Vernon in Skagit Valley. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Patricia, do you have any check-ins today? I didn't think about a check-in question this morning. At the end, we're going to talk about summing up Advocate Core. We're going to do that at the end. But do you have anything today that you wanted to throw in there? I would love for people, participants, to share in the chat their best technique for keeping cool. <laughs> Perfect. your best technique for keeping cool in these hot temperatures. We're always learning from one another. cold showers mm -hmm. I have a tiny little um like a home well uh desktop air conditioner that is you plug it in with a fan but you put ice inside of it <laughs> so if you don't have air conditioning it's like a little thing that sits on the desk oh la la did you get that online um i found it in ray's garage because she has weird stuff in there <laughs> that's a great item yeah freeze pops going only outside at 6 a.m or 10 p.m <laughs> <laughs> Mm. That's important too for the fur babies, protecting them from the hot concrete. Yeah. Oh yeah, misting. <laughs> I'm gonna do a little misting myself. Great, thank you for your input. Thanks, Patricia, for your great question. <laughs> Last <laughs> yesterday, I had I had power outages, so I couldn't get any of the materials out till late. So I, you know, what are you gonna do? It, power went off, and and so did the air conditioning, and I was like, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, been wonky over here in my neighborhood for power, but all right. Okay, Patricia, you're going to get us started this morning. Sure. So this session is legal advocacy. 
And no matter what system we navigate as advocates, we are bringing our advocacy skills, active listening, validating, normalizing, accompaniment, researching and resources, reframing, positive support, all techniques we have discussed so far in this training. And we will mix and match them in our approach, accessing our intuition and asking what will be helpful so the survivor is in the driver's seat. I would like to add to this list of active listening, validating, normalizing, mirroring. We are mirroring the language that they use, right? We are using their words um, to reflect back to them. And so that our conversations with them, our questions to them are not leading questions, but they're supporting the path that they're on. So yeah, um, legal advocacy is serving as a liaison between the survivor and legal system, discussing legal options, informing the survivor of their rights, and everybody has rights. Help prepare for the legal system experience. Accompany the survivor as they move through the criminal and civil proceedings in form of other services available. And, you know, with the lens of our immigrant and refugee community also, right? Our English language learners or monolingual in their um, indigenous languages or Spanish or other language. Thank you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. um, there's these kind of two formal legal systems um, that um, I just want to kind of um, look at before we go almost immediately into doing some practice and, and uh, not role plays, but just some group problem solving around different aspects of the criminal legal system. But just to kind of talk about some of those differences, the criminal legal system, the objective is punitive, right? It's to punish the wrongdoer. And the legal action is initiated by the state. So it's not survivor versus perpetrator, it's state versus perpetrator, right? And the survivor is just kind of to the side, right? As a, as a witness, right? Um, and then the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, right? You got to get a whole jury of your peers to say, yep, this happened, right? Um, and so that's a very high standard. With a civil legal system or so the civil legal process, the objective is to make an injured party whole. So to kind of give back what was taken, which is very strange to think of in the context of violence and abuse, um, but it is a system that is used uh, for sexual assault survivors, for domestic violence survivors, et cetera. The legal action is initiated by the victim of the crime or the victim of the abuse, the survivor, right? It's, sur it's survivor versus perpetrator or in the civil legal process, it is um, petitioner versus respondent. Whereas in the criminal system, state versus whoever. The standard of proof is called the preponderance of the evidence, which is more likely than not this happened. So the standard of proof is not so burdensome, right? It's not so huge. You can get a protection order or other kinds of civil relief if you have proven to, um, you know, like 51% to 49% that you feel scared or that you need protection or a thing happened to you, right? So that's kind of the differences here between criminal and civil um, legal advocacy. Now there's uh, a lot of stuff within your online learning course uh, about the civil system, about immigration relief, some things about housing and employment. Again, all of these things are constantly evolving as laws and policies change. Um, so I kind of tend to, over the years in this training, lean less on what those are and more on more backing up to say, 
How are we helping to support? How do we know where to find things? Um, and that Wix app does follow new bills and put out guidance um, every year for things that happen to change. Sexual assault protection order just changed this year. Uh, and uh, two years before that, it changed. Um, so learning all the nuances of a law or a policy is not as helpful as all of these things that Patricia is talking about, right? Stepping back and saying, what's my role? What do I do? Googling things that have changed, <laughs> you know, getting, um, and then just staying abreast of things as they change. At this point, everything in your online learning course is up to date. Um, but again, some of these things around the protection order just changed and the guidance isn't out yet until next month. And then we'll see how, how it has changed. One of the things that they're thinking about doing uh, or, or working on doing, not thinking about doing, they're working on a universal form for protection order, restraining order, anti-harassment order, domestic violence protection order, sexual assault protection order, to make them all in the same form, more with a box that you check saying it's one of these, instead of having all of these different, having a more universal protection order form to make it easier, more accessible for folks. One of the things they're also doing is allowing, um, it, during the pandemic, you know, people were allowed to uh, petition and then show up at court virtually. And that's something that has been very beneficial to a lot of survivors to not have to go physically in person, um, not just because of issues of transportation, but also the, the, the emotional issues, the fear around just like being there um, in court near the person who assaulted and abused them. So that's another thing that is shifting um, as something that's going to remain a possibility for survivors um, post-pandemic, right, which is a really cool thing. So I think that, that there's a lot of things that we've actually learned from this pandemic um, that we're able to integrate in to make things more accessible for survivors um, who, where transportation is such an issue, where just the getting out of the house can be hard, the childcare pieces, all of these different things, the just emotional uh, um, ability to, to show up and stand uh, in front of a judge, you know, about six feet from your abuser. So, um, so we are moving towards um, really a lot of better processes for sexual assault protection owners. But all this to say, it's not necessarily captured in what we're studying. So what we're going to do next is to look at the criminal justice processes and how we can be supportive to survivors who are in different, um, different parts of that process. And it's been my experience when I was doing legal advocacy um, for a few years. I worked in the family courts a lot with uh, survivors, mostly survivors of domestic violence. I also helped with U visas, uh, which is relief for immigrant uh, survivors who are victims of crime. And also um, through some of these criminal, criminal legal processes. Um, and what I'll tell you in my experience is that I never started at the beginning where I went with somebody to a police report and went all the way through to sentencing. Uh, I met people at different points of that process. They didn't know about advocacy services until halfway through their trial or their prosecutor decided not to charge. So I only got through the first kind of part. And so we're gonna do it and do some of these activities where, um, we are coming in at different points in time uh, without any continuity of the case because that's more reflective of sometimes the actual, um, unless you work in the prosecuting attorney's office, that this is not something you're gonna actually ever, you know, go from start to finish necessarily. If so, that's rare and that's really cool. That's really cool to be able to kind of go and walk with the survivor through the whole thing. But that's never been my experience in all of the um, time that I did advocacy and then specifically even legal advocacy. 
So we're going to get into groups um, and you're going to have a scenario and you're going to work with the groups of five or six people to review um, your scenario and you're going to be given a different aspect uh, or a different point on the criminal justice or criminal legal system timeline. Groups uh, one and seven will do reporting. Groups two and eight will do the police or the prosecutor interview. Uh, three and nine will do the charging decision or the arraignment. Four and whatever the next one is, four and we'll do defense interview. Five is trial, six is sentencing. Um, we are going to have more than six groups, likely, if we have mm, probably just a double up on one, two, and three, is my guess. Um, so, we're going to look at two topics both what are the victim rights, right? Because, as Patricia said, um, our job is to help inform people of their rights. And so we're going to give them to you. They're going to be right there in the um, in the link or in the handout that I emailed to you, uh, which was the first activity, right? So you're going to have all the answers there about what the rights are. And what you're really going to practice is how do we help in those particular scenarios? How do we help folks achieve those rights? or reinforce them? What are our strategies for saying, hey, did you know this is your right uh, in some of these different scenarios? How do we practice advocating? And we're not gonna do role play necessarily, but we are gonna do some brainstorming together in these small groups. One person will take notes, and then when we come back, we're gonna do some reporting, some reporting back, we're gonna do some discussion. So use the Jamboard to take notes, or you can take notes someplace else. It's kind of nice to have them all in the same place so we can kind of go through and review, putting your um, kind of main points on the um, sticky notes, or you can use the text to type in. Um, so have some per someone who uh, is in charge of maybe go reading over the scenario, going over the victim rights, somebody who's taking notes, and then somebody who, when we come back, will um, just give a little feedback around what you've discovered through these scenarios. Is that long enough of long-winded instructions? <laughs> Any questions while I make breakout rooms? If you have loud, you know, children or loud fans because you're just trying to cope with the thing, just mute when you're not talking, but please try to participate um, as much as you can. We're doing so much participation today, and I know that it's really hard because we're all working from home, and um, but we'll just do the best that we can to try to do that. If you are not in a place or a really loud place, maybe you can be the one who volunteered to take notes if you can hear, if you can hear well. I do have a question. This is Barbara. Yep. Hey, um, this is not on the specific, I mean, it's, it's, it's on the legal advocacy. Um, whose job is it to inform the survivor that the criminal attorney, that the, the prosecuting attorney is not representing the survivor. The survivor has no representation other than their advocate. So if the prosecutor does not want the survivor to submit a letter to the judge, then she can't, she has no way of doing it, he or she. And if, the survivor wants to speak to the judge, there is no way of doing that. I'm wondering whose job is it to inform the survivor and at what point should the survivor be aware? That they don't have representation or that they, I mean, you can get representation if that's something that's important uh, uh, to you, if you wanna have your own attorney to advocate on your behalf. Um, but I think advocates um, have a really important role in that 
um, kind of talking through and letting letting folks know if you are in on the beginning with folks that what to expect, right? And clarifying the differences between criminal justice and civil legal systems. So, and we're gonna keep talking about legal advocacy kind of all morning and some of those nuances, um, but uh, you know, I, I don't know, there's it's nobody's job, I guess. Um, nobody's assigned to do that, but I think that's a good place where we can be super helpful. Thank you. In, in particular, I was referring to my own situation where I was against the plea bargain because it just was weird sure. how the plea bargain came up. And I was like, oh, no way. He'll be out before my son graduates high school. And it was under very suspicious circumstances that the plea bargain came up. And the prosecuting attorney threw me, his victim, under the bus to the judge, lied to the judge so that I could not speak or be heard. And I just think that that's a horrific thing that survivors are already on pins and needles and so fearful and for a prosecuting attorney to turn on them because the, apparently his job depended on getting the plea bargain. He ended up losing his job afterwards, but yeah. Yeah, often they'll do a plea bargain if they can't, you know, if they are not able to, can't figure out how to go forward in, um, you know, proving their case. Um, that's an easier way to do it. Uh, if they can get people who will take a plea. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's not uncommon at all. Um, and I think that's why you know, we have a really important role in supporting people and letting people know kind of what the expectations are. It's like, this is not you versus them. This is the state versus them. And so are there other ways for us to achieve some different kinds of justice? And we're going to continue to talk about that. Um, but let's go into breakout rooms. We're going to do this for about 20 minutes. Um, again, if somebody can take notes, there in on the Jamboard, um, in you can click through to find your group. Um, so one and five, no, one and seven, two and eight, three and nine. Oh no, we only have six. We only have six groups. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Great. I'm opening the rooms now. We have about twenty minutes.
<clears throat> Welcome back, everyone. Okay, who's reporting back for group one? <clears throat> this is the, I'm gonna go through this, the Jamboard on my shared screen so you can follow along. Um, you know, feel free to also use your notes um, and then we'll give an opportunity for folks from other groups to ask questions of group one. So group one, go for it. <laughs> Carol, Courtney, Elena, Sole, and Talis. Any who is going to uh, report back for you all? I'm sorry if it's kind of loud. I have a big fan going right now. Um, what, what's your name? Oh, sorry. This is Elena. Elena, go for it. Um, so we primarily discussed um, that we should inform because the situation was that she wasn't entirely comfortable talking to the police and so to talk to her and um, you know see where her discomfort comes from and also to inform her that you know she doesn't need to disclose anything that she doesn't want to disclose and that the um, police should be there for her and for her case. And if that isn't the case, then she doesn't have to tell them anything. Um, and um, some group members suggested doing like a role play sort of thing, not where we tell them what to say, but where we ask questions that um, the police officer may ask them so that they can get practice um, and feel more comfortable with the things that they may be asked to disclose. Um, yeah, so pretty much discussed their rights as somebody who is talking to the police and that they are the number one person and the police are not the priority and what the police want to know is not priority, it's what the person has to disclose. Mm -hmm. And I see here too that even though she speaks really good English, still let her know that she has a right to an interpreter, right? Because she starts to, um, you know, just in case once we start talking about harder things, right, and, and kind of legal concepts uh, or emotionally weighted things, right, like we kind of um, feel stronger in our primary language, right? So that's always something that, um, that's a really good um, little note that I see here in your uh, notes, right? Letting, letting her know about CPS, that that's a possibility, so it's not a surprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Any questions for group one? Okay, let's go to group two. Allison, Benny, Lynn, Naomi, or Robin. I can just go over our notes, basically. Okay. What's um, your name? Robin. Thanks, Robin. So um, the scenario was Silas was sexually assaulted by an acquaintance on campus. He is afraid that the perpetrator could show up on campus when the quarter starts next week. The perpetrator has been spreading rumors and misinformation within their shared LGBTQ community. Um, we just talked about protecting Silas, intru introducing a protection order as part of safety planning, um, pr provide a copy of protection order to the school to see if a security guard can walk, basically uh, be with, Silas around campus. Silas could utilize Title IX and switch classes slash dorms for personal safety. 
they could go to the LGBTQ Center on campus for emotional support, work with the school to help the perpetrator remove from campus, advocate could accompany Silas to interview with the police or seek arrest of the perp, file a lawsuit against the perp, focused on what Silas is comfortable with, um, building a safety plan, including options for Silas to take if he sees his perp on campus, grounding techniques if he gets triggered, figuring out trusted people in the community he can rely on, um, working with the campus police. And Silas could talk with email professor, talk or email with professors to be able to do some homework from home. Mm -hmm. That's all we got. Great, Robin. That's awesome. Thank you. Any questions for group two? can really see here that you're building on all the skills, right? That you're talking about safety, that you're also talking about grounding techniques, you're talking about potential protection orders, but also just talking about those simple things like talking with or emailing the professors to say, hey, this is what's going on. Is there something we can do to right, work this out? So I like that, you know, we're looking at all of these broad different things, which is so important to our role, even as legal advocates or doing legal advocacy, there's so much more outside of that, right? Any questions for group two? All right, group three. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cheyenne and we have group three. I use she and her pronouns, sorry. Still mm -hmm, getting thank you. to that. Um, so our scenario was Haley was assaulted by her boss and I believe it was after the charges were filed. So our scenario, we just uh, brainstormed a couple things and I'll read them. Okay, so we were gonna let her know she has the right to attend the trial and has a right for support. Remind her she is not alone. Take her to visit the court beforehand and explain all the outcomes to her. And I just want to add, don't make any promises because that's a big one too. Mm -hmm. um, explain steps going forward, support her decisions through education. Um, somebody in the group shared knowledge is empowering. Mm -hmm. And she also had kind of a hostile work environment because it was her boss. So somebody suggested looking into those laws and it, if she did want to proceed with that, we'd know mm -hmm. how help her connect with a therapist or counselor and support groups. Ask her what would success look like for her. Ask her what she wants, but not asking too many questions. That was a good one too. Um, help her understand frequently used acronyms. Mm. Maybe prepare a sheet because some of the words are a little hard to understand. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Use grounding skills and silence to help lift the fog and help her process with a few open-ended questions. And if I missed anything, anybody speak up, but thank you. Thanks, Cheyenne. Any questions for group three or extra comments from the folks in group three? Yeah, so she definitely has employment protections. Um, you know, looking into what those are, oftentimes when I don't know right off the top of my head, if I'm working with someone saying there could be some employment protections for you and we should look into what those are um, as, you know, uh, you know, either connecting with an attorney or going on to, to wallahelp.org uh, to kind of look in and see um, what those employment protections are. Uh, especially because if you're having such a hostile work environment, um, it's so just closely tied to our abilities to like feed and clothe and, and you know, maintain income, right? So um, great job. Let's go uh, group four. Hi, this is Alyssa. Great, thanks. So we had... Nancy, who was raped by a friend of a friend. Um, they all went out for drinks. The two of them, um, the victim and the perpetrator, were the last to leave. They shared a cab home. The cab dropped her off first, and she went in alone. 
Uh, 20 minutes later, this person knocked on her living room window saying he wasn't tired and still wanted to party. Nancy agreed and let him in. So we're about three to six months into the process and we're getting ready for the defense interview. Mm -hmm. So we put um, first introduce yourself and your role. If for some reason you weren't involved through this whole process, you might want her to know who you are. Um, (laughs) Inform Nancy of her rights um, and go over resources and just explaining um, the process of what to expect and and what she's about to go through in this interview. Um, Some questions may be uncomfortable, but you have every right to, you know, take a break, step back, ground yourself. Um, If the attorney is there, explain his role or their role, sorry. Um, You know, if questions get relevant or anything, that's when your attorney will step in, all that good stuff. Um, And then prepare Nancy for either possible outcome, um, what happens next, what Nancy can do next, and again, go over those resources available to her. Um, Ask Nancy if she'd like to practice her statement, um, maybe go over possible interview questions, and all of that good stuff there. Um, And then we actually had a quick question about how the right to privacy would play into a defense interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But other than that, that's what we got. (laughs) Well, if we're in, if we're in a defense interview with folks, I mean, one, uh, it is the state versus the perpetrator. Survivors are often treated as a witness um, in these cases. Um, by the prosecutor and then the defense though doesn't treat them like a witness more like a an accuser right so um it it can be really a scary thing even though you don't necessarily have an attorney you absolutely can have an attorney um and that's something that we could advocate for uh with the um survivor you know trying to find a good referral for an attorney, a pro bono attorney, or uh, someone to be able to be there with her. Um, We, of course, can go with a survivor to anything. Um, What I find sometimes is when I went with folks, there wasn't always a chair for me. So I kind of have to advocate for myself to be able to be there, uh, even if, or just letting folks know ahead of time, hey, I'm going to be coming with um, this uh, survivor to the interview. And if we get into a place, because if we're looking at this case, she was raped by a friend of a friend, they were drinking, right? They, um, he came back and was like, you know, let's still hang out. And she let him in, right? Then we can see probably that they would, that the defense attorney would probably ask her about those things um, just because of what we know about rape culture in general, right? And the victim blaming kind of, aspects of that so um those are good things to kind of prepare and talk about ahead of time you know hey these things are questions that might get asked of you um maybe we didn't we weren't able to prepare what if somebody called us out and said come and meet this person at this defense interview and we didn't have a chance to prep that if those irrelevant questions that they have a right not to answer started um coming at you you know do you always have sex when you're drunk or just fine with you to just let some guy into your house? You know, those kind of things um, are not relevant, right? So could be also that right, you know, to privacy as well about your history and your past. So just being able to interrupt in that, in that circumstance, even though we're not attorneys to turn to the survivor that we're working with and say, Hey, you know, if you'd like to take a break, if you want to slow down, you know, we, maybe you want to just to try to interrupt some of that so that I can step out with her and have a conversation about, um, is this going okay? Do you feel, you know, just to be able to kind of um, create some space to reflect on um, whether or not, you know, she wants to keep moving forward with this interview, whether or not there's a she wants to go back and get an attorney, you know, those kinds of things that we can advocate for space, for breaks, um, to have a conversation alone, um, those kind of things. 
What does that the, answer your question? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is Barbara, same group. Mm -hmm. So what, what would a right to privacy look like specifically? Like, because the, the other things were, were mentioned that you mentioned as part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have the list in front of me now, but uh, so what, and what does privacy cover? Does that mean like um, they sh like you're saying, you know, relevant questions only, but um, does she, she has obviously a right to privacy of her residence. You know, there's the ACP program. Um, she has a right to not speak about things that don't matter, such as, you know, her children, how her children are doing. I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, we're just trying to think of specific things that would be pertaining to upholding her right to privacy. What, what, what can she keep private that would be acknowledged in that particular statement of this particular um, thing that we just did? I'm sorry, I can't come up with words right now. Like some examples of what's private. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. I, I mean, it's, it's generally just things that aren't relevant to the, to the case and, and personal details and in history. Yeah, of course, things about your children. Um, um, it, it's really pretty, pretty broad. And also like there are rights, we are helping to remind them of those rights so they can assert their rights. And also knowing that there's not necessarily a direct mechanism to enforce them, right? Uh, those aren't the kind of things that law enforcement are, are, are kind of enforcing is your right to privacy. Um, but it is something you can advocate for with the judge. If you have a systems advocate and advocate through the prosecuting attorney's office, that's always the best person to talk to about these different things. Um, some prosecuting attorney's offices uh, do have um, advocates that work for them that really kind of focus on taking care of that survivor witness um, and keeping them informed. Um, but they don't have confidentiality and privilege, uh, but like we do as community-based advocates. So we can kind of keep more uh, in the realm of privacy, but you can work with the prosecuting attorney's office to help advocate for, um, for those different, you know, pieces of privacy to have different things sealed to um, not do an interview in a hallway where there are people around. That's, that's a really basic one. And I think that's the kind of thing that comes up the most. It's like, who are all these people that are here? You know, it's like, I am, you know, giving you your, you know, responding to information. I'm giving police interviews. I'm doing all of these different things, but I deserve them to be in a private location, you know, without people walking in and out. Uh, I deserve to know all the people that are here and who's going to get my information, you know, that kind of thing. So it can be pretty broad, uh, but also like if, if, you know, different attorneys could argue, you know, to a judge or um, to get more information if they are able to prove that it's pertinent to the case. Great points. Thank you. We hadn't thought about that, about mm -hmm. being in a public place, et cetera. Yeah, that's, that's really, I feel like that's the most common thing. It's like, I have a right to privacy and who are all these people that are here, right? Or you know, I want a more private place for us to, to meet. And I think that's a really big, that's a really big one, really simple one, really good and easy way for us as advocates to say, hey, um, this seems kind of not private. Like, let's, um, let's see if we can find a space. If this, if you don't have a space, Mr. Attorney, like we can do it at my office or, you know, like trying to invite or create like a safer, more private place for, for these kind of things. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you. All right, group five. I'll probably go. This is Smitty. Thank you, Smitty. <laughs> Hi. Um, so um, our group, uh, the scenario was uh, Celia was assaulted by her neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. She is originally an immigrant from El Salvador and after the assault she stayed at a shelter because she was afraid um let's see she wants to attend the trial but she has difficulty getting time off of work 
and uh, she heard that another employee uh, wanted to take time off for a, for an appointment and was fired. So, um, and then. Let's see. Oh, um, some scheduling issues uh, with the um, with the courts, and then has sometimes has to carpool uh, to get there on time. Um, so one thing, you know, it's easy to get caught up in in the process. And me personally, I'll I'll say that I made a boo boo and skipped over the most important thing here, which was the safety of the client. So I know we started to end up talking about a lot of the rights of the client and um, what to do for the client, but um, I kind of skipped over the most important part was that the fact that um, the subject was the neighbor. So maybe uh, does she have family that she can stay with uh, right around the time that he's released or, or prior to? Um, so kind of working out uh, safety first for the client. Um, second thing we talked about was removing all the barriers uh, because um, trying to get the time off of work and the financial impact on the client is, is huge. And so slowly trying to remove those uh, difficulties or challenges uh, um, so that the client can focus on, on the other things, uh, like maybe um, Office of Crime Victims or other nonprofits that right. can provide resources. Um, and then every prosecuting attorney's office, maybe not every, but almost everyone that I know has victim advocates um, that work there. And having those relationships with those individuals and being able to advocate for your client to say, hey, um, can we work with the court to move the trial or do a better job of not rescheduling uh, the date at the last minute so that the mm. client can react? You know, transportation is an issue and things like that. So um, just really living up to that advocate word of, of our, our job, our responsibility. Um, let's see. And then just being present, being being there for the client, so that uh, they know that um, someone's there for them. Because this is uh, a lot. I mean, the financial aspects is one. Transportation, being afraid for your life and um, your neighbors, the perpetrator, and um, so there was a lot there, and mm -hmm. uh, we. Yeah, did the best we could to discuss that, but I think I got lost in the process and uh, didn't focus on the safety of the client. So, yeah, that was my uh, my mistake. Well, there there's always more, <laughs> right? And there's always things that we don't necessarily um, know about these from these smaller scenarios. So this is about ten months ago. You know, maybe something has happened with her safety since then. If it's if it you know, is going through a criminal process and we're all the way down the road here to, you know, trial, uh, maybe there are some protective order things in process, but that's definitely something we can talk about is, you know, where do you have to stay safe so you're not next door to this person, right? Or, you know, how can we work with those victim advocates, those prosecuting attorneys office, uh, offices to advocate for that safety piece for our or the survivor that we're working with like uh no contact order or something like that help us out with you know some way to help keep this person safe and and i think the really important part here is that you have a right to have your the costs associated to be reimbursed and you can do that you know through talking with the prosecuting attorney's office but also applying through crime victims compensation for things like lost wages um, especially because this is a criminal process that's happening, crime victims compensation uh, uh, would not really have a reason to deny that claim. Um, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean claims don't get denied because it is insurance, right? <laughs> we know that that kind of thing happens. Um, but also those things can be um, 
appealed and things like that. But, you know, just, just having that knowledge as an advocate saying, you know, what I'm hearing you say is that you are like, don't want to participate in this trial because it's a huge burden for you financially. Let me also like, just tell you about these different ways that we can help out. Like, you know, you can get your expenses reimbursed. However, of course, like trying that's, that's a reimbursement, right? Sometimes you need things up front. So as, as the program, do we have things like gas cards and bus passes and different things like that, that we're able to, you know, give her, even if she doesn't drive, but she has a family member, her cousin, her, her other neighbor that, you know, will drive her into town, the gas card can go to that person. It doesn't have to go directly to, you know, as long as it's assisting her in being able to come into town. So how can we kind of think about those things just a little more broadly around all the things to help create less barriers for her to be participating in this, right? So thank you so much, Mitty and group five. Group six. Hi, this is Rachel. I'll be reading for group six. Um, Sanjay was assaulted almost one year ago when he was leaving a nightclub after closing. He was raped and physically assaulted by a man he had seen earlier that evening but had never talked to or seen before that day. Sanjay tells you that he is exhausted and ready for this to be over and he is angry with the system. What has happened to him and at his assailant? He really wants to express this but doesn't know how. Since the conviction happened a couple weeks ago, his emotions have, become, have come to the forefront. He's overwhelmed and wants support. So um, our group talked about a few things. Um, first was like validating his frustrations and emotions and being there to listen and validate, validate, validate. Um, when court actually happened, well, inform him about court dates um, and restitution, because that seems like a big deal. And we also know that restitution is part of the sentencing so that that will be a next step after that or talked about during sentencing um, with let him know that he can um, submit and present an impact statement if he wants. And so like being there with him while he's writing that um, and offering the option of uh, it says that he's overwhelmed. So offering the option that the advocate could read that for him if he wants and it's up to him helping him organize his thoughts for a statement by just listening and being there um being present beside him during the reading if he wants it um also informing him of kind of some after effects so um that he can ask for specific conditions and like what some of those are like drug and alcohol classes i think are under that um letting him know that hiv and sti testing can be asked for um providing therapy resources again if sanjay hasn't accessed those yet just like reminding him that they're there and that crime victim compensation is there if he needs it um making sure that Sanjay knows that personal belongings are his again and that he can ask for those and sort through what he wants and how to ask for that. And then um, letting him know about protection orders, um, what which ones apply, what they are, and that he has some civil um, options if the criminal ones aren't satisfying for him. And then also just like letting him know that he also has civil choices about prosecution so that if he feels like he wants to keep going and get more, more of his needs met, uh, legally speaking, that he can go take a civil option. Right. Great. Awesome job. You know, I really, I just want to just um, also just say something real briefly about uh, victim impact statements, um, because that is one of your rights, and it's also a really big part of that. Did anybody watch the sentencing of Derek Chauvin um, just a few days ago? Uh, maybe it was Friday. Um, if you're able to take a look at that, that's a really good example of, you know, having different people be able to come forward, read their, their statement to the court about the impact of this crime right before the judge makes a decision about how long, right? And what, you, what you'll see in that one um, with the Derek Chauvin sentencing, you'll see there's a victim advocate there just standing right next to those people as they're doing their, um, their statement, which is really cool. Um, so, um, it, it, you know, these kind of things are also available for um, any victims of crime, you know, survivors of 
of uh, the, the survivors of a homicide victim and things like that. So um, I really like being able to work with folks through a victim impact statement. And that can look like, you know, like you said, you know, offering to read it for them if that's something that's hard, um, if that's something that's allowed by the judge. Um, just letting them read it to you, uh, helping, letting them talk while you write it for them or type it, uh, and then going back and editing it together. Um, a, and if there is a plea deal or we don't get here, that it's still something that it can be really powerful to do, an exercise to go through to create a victim impact statement. Um, and we're going to keep talking about that when, you, when you're not able to access the regular uh, kind of mainstream criminal justice system. What are some of the other options to be able to go through that, these processes that are super powerful? So we're gonna, we're gonna continue with that. But thank you, group six. Thank you everyone for kind of jumping in. Um, you know, we're practicing on about something that we don't have any experience with yet necessarily, right? And um, this, is, this is how we're learning. So I appreciate you just jumping in and, and working with one another uh, through these different scenarios and um, these different victim rights. So let's take a break. Um, and then we'll come back at 11. It's 10.53 right now. So we'll come back at 11 and move through uh, the rest of the slides and probably do some more role play at the end. Okay. See you back here at 11. I let, I let Keela in and I'm like, whew. Oh, Keela, don't go out there. Or Keela, Keela, don't go outside. It's too hot. <clears throat> right. I know my dogs keep trying to go outside and play and I'm like, you, it is hot. You, mm -hmm. you need to get Too in here. Hot. Is this my, um, my slide? Yep. You're going to get started here. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> go for it. Thank you. So we are in the me too, hashtag me too era. We are faced with a different level of public disclosures of sexual assault and public naming of abusers on social media. Um, and one example is Chanel Miller. And um, that whole scenario, and there are many others. So in the chat, what does this tell us about our current culture of justice and healing? rooting ourselves in and reaffirming the philosophy of survivor-centered and individualized advocacy can be helpful, can be a helpful way to navigate this climate. Survivor-centered service means that justice is, is defined by survivors. There are diverse ways that each survivor we meet, we meet with will want to see and experience justice without, beyond, or in addition to jail time for those who perpetrated abuse. We're going to look at concepts of justice and how we can support survivors in discovering and choosing forms of justice that are right for them, that are individualized. So philosophical approach to legal advocacy. We believe survivors. We believe survivors deserve justice and healing. We believe survivors deserve their own form of justice and healing. We believe that each survivor has inherent knowledge about their needs. And we understand that exercising control and choice is integral to trauma recovery. And we help them, we add part of being an advocate is helping them unpack the information they bring from within themselves. Survivor-centered services means that justice is defined by survivors. And, and let's see what we have in the chat. Anything in the chat? Oh, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, I was just, I just put in the chat, Chanel Miller wrote that book, Know My Name, right? Patricia, you read yes. that. What's that book called? Is that what it's called? Okay. It's, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and she was the a survivor who was known as Emily Doe for a while. She wrote a very powerful victim impact statement. Um, I forgot the guy's name that sexually assaulted her at Stanford. Sorry? Oh, Brock Turner. Brock Turner, thank you. 
Um, so she wrote this book and came out, you know, and said, I'm not going to go by Emily Doe anymore. This is me. This is who I am. This is my story. Um, and wrote a lot in it about the victim advocates that she worked with. How she was failed by this system that only gave her perpetrator three months, even after she wrote the most powerful um, victim impact statement, right? And it's um, been trans translated into many languages. It's being used right. all over the world. Yeah. So we're just starting to kind of explore some different ways that people are speaking out about their issues, getting things, um, doing some of those things like naming Harvey Weinstein and um, and Kevin Spacey and, and like people really putting themselves out there and using uh, the internet and different things like that to be able to name their abusers and kind of seek their own um, justice almost. So we're going to look at some of those kind of things and think about accountability. That. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's accountability. It's um, and I just want to want to reiterate that if it pushes our triggers because someone does not want to report what happened to them to the police, then we need to delve into that within ourselves because it's very real that many people will not want to have anything to do with the police, a detective, any of that. And as advocates, we need to get over it, get over it. That is our own shit, not theirs. So, Take a look at some activist art in response to the killing of black people by police, the separation of children, um, immigrant children from their parents. Regardless of what we as individuals believe, what we as individuals think are solutions, this is a reality for communities that many survivors come from. It impacts not only their trust in systems, but help seeking behavior in general. We have to take into account the social and political reality of communities' relationships with law enforcement and their perception of justice. We have to remain open to possibilities as defined by survivors. How they define safety, fear, justice, trust, that's what we need to um, flow with, to be fluid with, and suspend our judgment. And again, if we've got to unpack stuff that's our stuff, do that. Michelle, would you like to um, add anything to this? Yeah, I just think, you know, um, looking at these images, thinking about, right, like Patricia said, like the the political and social realities of communities and that all of those different communities are experiencing trauma and violence and sexual assault that, you know, just, just not making those assumptions that we're setting the tone up front that accessing the police is not an option for a lot of people and for a lot of people who have access to the police and have not had it, um, like Chanel Miller, who went all the way through a criminal justice process and still felt failed, right? That these are things that we see in the media that if I'm thinking, gosh, what would I do if I were assaulted tomorrow? Would I move forward with these things? That a lot of that, those thoughts, that knowledge, that inherent kind of decision-making is already formed by what we know the experience of our communities are or what we perceive as the experience of our communities. So it doesn't really matter. We can't talk somebody in or out of anything and we shouldn't, but we can't because those perceptions are, um, are very well, you know, formed through the, the actual experience of different communities, right? The fear of immigration, of ICE, the fear of the police, um, the fear of the everyday racism or anti-immigrant sentiment is very pertinent to legal advocacy and um, the choices that people are going to make around how they experience justice and accountability. And these are just kind of two communities 
and there are so many, right? The LGBT community is going to, you know, see it, see it in particular ways and have different experiences in the different locations that they're in across the country. That experience of the LGBT community is different in Seattle than it is in Arkansas, right? And um, so those localities also impact that as well. So just being aware of this, being open to the different experiences of justice processes on different communities and individuals. We don't know somebody's experience from when they were a child and if they've ever called the police and what that was like. Um, you know, the neighborhood that I grew up in, you didn't call the police. That just wasn't what you did in my neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, if I call someplace and, they're in, and get an answering machine that's like, if this is an emergency, call 911. I'd be like, well, if this is an emergency, that's probably not what I'm gonna do. But that's our default, right? So just even thinking about what our default is um, and having some awareness around that, um, I think is really beneficial to us. So just a little bit about some concepts of justice, right? The first one being um, criminal justice, which we just talked about, or the criminal legal system, as our executive director likes to say, because justice is, is, rel is relative. Um, this intervenes when someone has broken a rule rather than caused harm. The focus is on you broke the law, not the harm that's caused, right? The punishments are, are oftentimes really predetermined or enshrined in law or policy, like things like mandatory minimums, um, um, but also could be um, determined by uh, a judge who is in the same community as somebody who's a perpetrator, right? I mean, these kind of things happen in smaller communities. Uh, the state is deemed the offended party, like I said in the beginning. It's the state versus the person who um, assaulted the survivor. The survivor can choose to interact with the criminal justice process for many reasons, uh, including but not limited to a feeling that the process removes um, or limits the survivor agency, that the process is, ex it, is it, <clears throat> excuse me, the feeling that the process removes or limits the survivor agency, that the process is, ex is controlled externally. So you might not want to participate in that where you are not in your full agency, if you're not in your full ability to make choices and decisions, right? Um, they may not want to because the burden of proof is placed on them, even though they are not named as, um, you know, as a party in that um case right the state versus the person who did it not the survivor right but the burden is still on them about the proof the processes require the survivor to recall remember and retell their assault which may lead to from further traumatization and also that the criminal legal systems really want you to establish a linear narrative which we know from the neurobiological reactions of trauma that we learn in session three and session four and session five, that these are not things um, that are always possible, that often aren't possible. And the legal system is, you know, there are a lot of organizations like End Violence Against Women International that are trying to train prosecutors and police and, you know, in this, but it's still catching up, right? So these are still things that are very present. Um, the process inadvertently or sometimes more blatantly blames the survivor. There's a very low success rate of, you mean, you mean meaning a uh, rate of conviction. It's like 1% of, um, I think that's the RAIN statistic, uh, rape, abuse, incest, national network, uh, RAIN. They have statistics on you know the rate that, of which people are you know convicted of sexual violence and it's incredibly low like one percent are going to spend at least one day in jail like it's not very very much and even getting through even half of the criminal justice process without a, something you know getting dropped is just it's just not very high so it also limits the Survivor privacy, you might have a right to, to privacy, but records, um, open court, public records, media attention if it's a big, you know, if it's a big thing, uh, like 
some of these um, these ones that I've been referencing, right? Like Chanel Miller, like, um, and, you know, her privacy, she was able to go as Emily Doe, but it was also like a lot of people found out who she was anyway. And, you know, you just might not want to participate in it because, you know, people are going to know who you are, or find out about you, right? Even if it's not your fault, even if you know it's not your fault, you still might want that privacy. We don't have control over as much about it. So a lot of times, some of these concepts of justice feel abstract, they feel uncertain. So talking about these kind of things with, um, with survivors can be really helpful. It's really good for us to examine these different concepts of justice so that we can locate our role as advocates while working with survivors who might be engaged in, in very different um, processes, right? Um, restorative justice is another uh, concept that is intended for the one to cause harm to give back or to restore. Uh, another kind of, um, these are a lot of times civil type processes, but can also be less formal um, or things like community-based. Uh, sometimes they use these as alternatives to incarceration. One of the um, examples that I have is a uh, school system in Oakland that uses this um, restorative justice processes to help, you know, um, support the, the kind of, uh, or help fight against the school to prison pipeline with students, you know, like um, um, providing opportunities to figure these things out internally through restorative justice processes that don't involve the state, but involve all the parties that are harmed and the parties that have done the harm. In this particular scenario, there was a, a student, a male student who was um, telling people that he slept with this other, um, with this girl at school and um, spreading rumors about her. He was sexually harassing her by like leaving porn in her locker or something like that. And so the, he was, they found, you know, they discovered that he was doing this and they went in to do restorative justice process to the school and asking her, what do you want? What will help make you help, help repair this harm that was caused by this person? And then, you know, for the process to work, uh, she would need to say, here's what I want, here's what I think will help, and then he needs to, to do it, right? Um, and have that accountability. Um, so besides things like apologizing, like what are you going to do to repair the harm? And what she wanted was for him to go to these particular popular kids to tell him that he was lying about her because she knew she could get, if, if he would tell the popular kids and that would help like cut down the rumor mill in their particular um, um, school um, community. So the, the theory works when you are very familiar with your community and the um, and it, there is a community like a school system where uh, this kind of thing can be can be worked out or in smaller communities um, and sometimes again like I said in um, alternatives to incarceration um, processes like um, deferment so the aim of restorative justice is to hold individuals, not systems, responsible for harm caused and to ultimately restore those harmed as close to like a pre-harmed status as possible. So these can give survivors more opportunities to participate um, and they incorporate survivors more, uh, more directly and um, it doesn't necessarily take into consideration those broader systems of oppression, but it does help with that kind of interpersonal piece uh, where their survivor has a little bit more like, this is what I want, and that is directly relayed and worked out. That it's not a process without that survivor saying, this is what will bring me as close to pre-harm status as possible. Um, it can, of course, result in an inequitable dynamic if the one who caused harm has more social, cultural, or political power, right? Not gonna work if I am trying to do this with a celebrity, right? This is not gonna work. Or if, um, if 
you know, a black woman is trying to go through this process with a, a white man who has been, um, who is in a political office, right? <clears throat> All of these things have to be taken into consideration for them to, to, to work. And that looks more like transformative justice where you're looking at these bigger systems and the thing about transformative justice is that it's still, Aorta says the story of transformative justice is still being written, right? Because the idea, the theory is to hold individuals responsible for harm caused. However, taking into account those broader systems of oppression to help equalize, right? To help find more equity. It looks at both the behaviors and systems as opposed to the simple individual actor. A lot of us who have been uh, abused or assaulted and come into doing this kind of work, um, we want to make a change in a system. We advocate for these different pieces. Um, it's part of our transformative justice process at times. It's not a formal thing, but it is something that's so common. I interviewed a number of survivors in Olympia where I was where I'd been working as an advocate for a long time, asking people what justice was and how they achieved healing. And the majority of them, you know, were able to transform a lot of their harm by working back on situations and systems of oppression and rape culture and looking to examine the systems instead of just the individual actor and trying to change those either through going into schools and doing prevention, going uh, and doing policy work or, or testifying for bills um, to pass uh, if something is close to your experience that needs to be um, revised, right? Uh, Barbara, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but that's something that you've talked about just since the very beginning in this particular training too. It's like, here's what happened with me and that was not good. So how, who's responsible for this? How do we change that, right? That's part of our process in sometimes coming into this work to start to try to transform and look at those broader systems and say, this is a bad, this person harmed me. And also this system needs repair, right? So again, this kind of thing is still being written because there's not necessarily beginning and end to this work, but it's definitely connected to what we're doing and something we wanna to move towards that we start to do more prevention and less intervention, that we stop it before it starts, right? That we're, we try to shift that and that when things do happen, that we are responding appropriately based on what we've learned about these systems that are broken, that are inequitable, or that aren't working for survivors, right? So it has to involve a willingness by our communities to really deeply question our status quo and imagine um, things beyond our current systems that we have available, right? This is similar to why a lot of people recently have been saying things like defund the police, abolish ICE, right? This is a movement working to push transformative justice system, taking funds from policing uh, and putting them into mental health services, education, creating things like community care teams, de-escalation professionals, that kind of stuff is transformative justice. It's not saying there are no cops, but what can we do to help start to make this more equitable that we are moving further upstream, um, as they say in the prevention world, right? Um, it's also really important that we acknowledge, kind of as we do when we do our land acknowledgement, that we acknowledge that um, long before European colonization of, US, of the U.S., indigenous communities here and probably everywhere uh, around the globe held concepts and models of transformative justice in various forms, that our constitution is one thing, and there's been a lot of things long before that in what justice can look like, and these methods have been used in in communities of color currently, I've been using queer communities, in faith communities, and activist communities, right? So these aren't things that are impossible. And, and it's just to say, here's these different concepts of what justice is. What are what what can this kind of look like? How does this apply to our advocacy? 
um, how do we work with survivors around some of these concepts? And that's kind of what we're gonna look at next. And am I giving this to Patricia? Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder, I mean, I, probably we don't need a reminder, but it's a patriarchal misogynistic system. And so it's really, really fucked up, right? It, it is. Um, so the feeling of justice is a very personal one. While for some, a guilty verdict in a criminal justice process can ease the fear of not being believed survivors report that it often doesn't feel like justice. And we can say, go back to the Chanel Miller, was that justice? Where the rapist and the father, you know, were allowed, were, were put on a pedestal? Um, a survivor's feelings about the outcomes of a justice process are connected to their expectations. As is true for healing, justice is not a linear process like we might see on television. We are all influenced by external concepts of justice. This information drives our expectations. In advocacy, it is helpful to discuss the survivor's personal expansive definition of justice. And this takes time for them to process it through their hearts and through their minds and get it out of their mouth and articulate it. This is one mode by which we can empower survivors to define and manage their expectations. Explore the following prompts in a format that the survivor feels works best for them, such as talking, journaling, collaging, drawing, mind mapping, and more. We'll start with the bullets. Um, what does justice feel like? What does justice look like? Even what does it sound like, taste like, smell like? From whom or from where do you need justice? What needs to happen for me to experience justice? What words or images come to mind when I think about justice? What do I need right now to move forward? What will I need next year to move forward still? What can justice provide me that I am missing? How is justice connected to my healing? Other terms to explore related to justice are accountability, closure, revenge, forgiveness, fairness, punishment. Support groups can be really good venues for these conversations, as well as individual advocacy. And I just remind you that the silence is really important because there's a lot going on in the mind, right? So get comfortable with the silence. And it's a, it can be a very, very long process and it's not linear, it's all over the place. So, yeah. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, sorry about that. Let's so other ways that we're gonna maybe be exploring the concept of justice with survivors um, is by listening to these different kind of things that a survivor might want um, or that they might say to you. Um, because I live in Olympia, which is a you know a very activisty town, uh, I've got Evergreen State College. I mean, there's a lot of things that um, I've worked with a lot of young survivors um, here in this in this activist community that they they would bring up lots of different concepts of justice, which began kind of the way that I, uh, especially because I was doing legal advocacy and I was only kind of looking at this criminal system or this civil protection order system that people wanted to explore all of these different things. And 
I was like, I don't know how to do that. Um, but a lot of the times they did, or they were able to process these different things with me. Like they might want to express a need to be believed, which could be achieved through telling their story in a public supportive place. I absolutely had a survivor whose criminal process failed her. It didn't provide her what she needed. Um, I think that they wouldn't charge him. She went through a police report, but the charge, they just wouldn't do it. Um, and when I talked to her, just even some years after, uh, when I was doing my project interviewing survivors in Olympia, she said, I wanted to be in a room full of people and to tell my story. And I wanted everybody to believe me. And that was the first time that I thought, I think we could do that. Like, I think we have enough people around here that we can like pull in some chairs and bring in some other advocates and that we could sit here, listen to your story and say, well, yeah, we believe you, right? That maybe that's what you're looking for from the court, but is there other ways that we can recreate that, right? You know that a lot of survivors are on things like speakers bureaus or they're, they're, they're sharing their story in these different ways, right? Um, a survivor might want something that feels official that shows what happened to them, uh, which could be achieved by having something like a protection order granted, even if safety is not their ultimate goal. Protector, protection orders are for safety, um, but they also provide through the preponderance of the evidence, right, that more likely than not that this happened, an easier burden of proof that you have a judge say, I find that by preponderance of the evidence, this happened to you. And maybe that's what you need. You want that thing that says this happened, that it's a public record, um, even though you don't feel like this person's gonna come after you or attack you or, or safety was not, your, was not your ultimate goal, but something could be achieved this way. I worked with a survivor on this um, when she, was like, I don't really need safety, but I need somebody to say this happened. And I was like, well, if we get a protection order, that could probably happen. It's a little bit easier to do, um, shorter process, less burden, right? That there are other civil actions where that kind of thing can happen, like in the last bullet here, where you want to want the perpetrator to literally pay, which could be accomplished through a civil lawsuit. I've also seen where, um, an abusive you know partner had gone to therapy and um or excuse me the the survivor had gone to therapy and just asked the perpetrator to pay and then he wrote her a check i mean it's not it doesn't seem huge but it was something that she really wanted him to pay for it and she was able to accomplish that um they might want to out their abuser in their shared community. They might want to seek confrontation or apology or accountability. Um, they might just want the abuse in general not to happen to anyone else, which might be addressed through prevention work or activism, right? Like we talked about lobbying Congress or, or your local legislators about, you know, how these things didn't work out for you and you want them changed. Um, and also the criminal justice system. If somebody is literally put in jail, they're not able to abuse somebody else in the broader community. So just some of these things have been uh, themes that have showed up in my work, uh, working with individual survivors over, over years. There's some examples here, a couple of them. Um, Aisha Shahida Simmons is an anti-rape activist. She was one of our keynote speakers. Um, that we had this year on a panel. She wrote a book called um, Love with Accountability, which is an anthology of survivors, mostly survivors of color, black survivors, of uh, their experiences um, with sexual violence, healing and justice. And most of it not having anything to do with, you know, kind of the, the, the criminal legal system. And her, particular story where love with accountability the, the term comes from is that she was an incest survivor and she confronted her divorced parents about their lack of response to being sexually abused as a child. There's a lot of accountability work to be done within family units, right? Even, and her, her, uh, 
perpetrator had since died. Um, but she wanted to talk to her parents about how they allowed this to happen, how they didn't intervene when she told them what happened. That she, and every time she wrote an email to them, she would sign it love with accountability. I love you and I also need you to be responsible. I need you to acknowledge these things so that I can heal and move on. And I feel like that that's a really common thread around issues of child sexual abuse. It's like, who was not protecting me? Right? That that can be more strong than an adult who's a survivor. That strong, somebody didn't protect this child that was me, right? And there needs to be some accountability for those who didn't protect me. And that might be a really strong place. And so I highly recommend Aisha Shahida Simmons, her book or just her, her blogs that she has. Um, her and her mother wrote an article about this process that they went through, right? Even though her mom wasn't the perpetrator, her mom was so important in protecting her and they didn't, uh, and that was something that needed to be processed. Um, and then Nancy Schwartzman uh, made a documentary called The Line in which she confronts the man who raped her and she films it in an attempt to move through her own trauma and experience and better understand what is co consent and coercion? Because what felt like sexual assault to her, he didn't see it that way, right? And so that was something that she needed to do in one of the projects she did, right? People, survivors are making art and creating things out of our pain and our search for justice and healing that is really important. So I don't want us to discount that just because this criminal legal process didn't work or this civil legal process isn't an option that there's not creative things that survivors are doing every day to work towards transforming these different systems and transforming their own experiences. Any thoughts or questions? I know that these are kind of big concepts and I know we're gonna talk about legal advocacy and we kind of didn't because that's the point. <laughs> big thoughts, big concepts. Um, I just want us to all just be really rooted in validating people's experience, the validating the inherent knowledge that survivors have about what it is that they need. And like Patricia said, to, to flow, to flow with it. We can't do everything and a lot of things we can't do at all, right? I'm not going to facilitate somebody's restorative justice process because that's not my role. I don't facilitate a criminal justice process either. But to talk about these things and explore different things that people need and trying to help them figure out, because some people think their expectations are law and order, it's CSI, it's Special Victims Unit, it's you know, all of these procedurals that create these expectations that something's going to be summed up in an hour and that everybody's Mariska Hegarty, and they're not, right? And so they might go through a system and then just be disappointed. Their expectations are changed. So what else is there? What is it that you need? Because what if, what, if what you need is a judge to do the thing, that you need this jail time situation, that you need something that looks like that procedural, then great. But why? What does that feel like? What, is that, what will that give you? What is missing? And so just to be able to set those expectations and also to just examine what it is that we need, what we're looking for, so that if we don't get it here, we can start to think about where else we can get it, how else we can achieve it and continue to heal through it. Okay, we're gonna do some more practice uh, in groups of two and three. <clears throat> Uh, the other, we're going to use the other activity that was 
in your, let me get out of here. The other activity that was in your email, but I'll also put the link. There's three role plays. Um, and we're going to work on them in groups of two and three, just more opportunity to practice. As I said in the beginning, you know, we just, we, the more we go through this, the more we're going to do some, some practicing. Um, so if there's three people, one person is the observer, uh, and then take turns, there's three scenarios. And we're going to work through this for about, oh, I don't know, about 15, maybe 20 minutes, probably 15 minutes. Okay, opening the room. Okay, welcome back. This is Barbara, may I ask a question? Please. Okay, so on the one regarding the 12 year old boy, that was, I think the toughest one for us because we have to let them know that we're a mandated reporter, but at the same time, we don't want them to hang up. We wanna make sure that they get the services that they need. Mm -hmm. What kind of recommendations would you make if you were the advocate? What would you say to keep them seeking services and getting them safe? Great question, Barbara. Thank you for bringing that. Um, let's hear from folks who practiced that one. What do you think before I jump in? <laughs> hey, this is Rachel McHugh. Um, in terms of hotlines, um, often the person doesn't actually disclose their age and all, and um, that can make it a little bit tricky even when you, because as a hotline advocate, part of the, part of that role is trying not to read into like the type of voice they say, seem like they have and those kinds of things. And, and so um, even from the get go, or certainly if, if conversations seem to be going down a road of any minor potentially being involved, even like on the periphery and all, I just kind of um, mention the reporting um, harm to self or others and child abuse, but I do it kind of in a way where I, I kind of empower them in what they want to tell me by saying, you know, if, if I really, if I have identifiable information about the, these types of situations. And that kind of um, leaves them, you know, I've actually had experiences where the person was kind of like, yeah, could you report that for me? Here's the names and addresses, et cetera. But that doesn't mm -hmm. happen as often. Often it's kind of like, they're like, oh, okay, that's really good to know. And I've actually, especially if the situation involves like the person who's calling is actually calling because they're worried about like a sibling or a friend or a cousin, then they're kind of like, you hear this pause and then they're like, so how do you do that? Because that's really the kind of thing that they're calling for 
is like, and the same, even if it's themselves, it's kind of like, how would I seek that kind of help? And, you know, but then it also kind of allows them to talk about the situation, but in more generalities or like saying that it's like a friend and those types of things. Mm -hmm. And it can be really frustrating if you're, if you are like seriously concerned about the immediate safety of the person on the line. And if so, then, then you can do almost a sort of assessment about that level of the eminent threat. Um, but keeping them, keeping them on the line is, is really the critical thing. And at those times, because it increases the chances that if they are in some sort of eminent concern, they, they will feel comfortable then connecting with someone else and, or will keep calling back until they do. Mm -hmm. Rachel, thank you. That's a great answer. And, you know, this scenario is very similar to one that I had that I really, I was pushing her, I could tell she was young. She was talking about what was happening to her. She was really worried it was going to happen to her sister as well. It was her dad. And, but, and I, w I found myself just trying to investigate where she was calling from. And then I wasn't helping her um, because she never told me. But so I'm, I wish a lot of times that I could go back. So I was like, oh, what school do you go to? Like, I was like, just trying to like engage in conversation so that I could make a report. But then I wasn't talking to her about, you know, making a safety plan for herself when, when she clearly wasn't going to tell me who she was. She didn't want me to make a report. She was just wanted to talk to me. Um, and so if I could go back, I really would change how I was having that conversation because I was letting myself like, I just, I wanted to save her and that just wasn't going to happen, right? Because I am responsible to survivors, but I'm not responsible for them. I'm responsible to make a report if there's a child, but if they don't give me information, there's nothing, I can't give that information. And that's the most challenging part about working on hotlines. You don't know who anybody is. And that's also the benefit of the hotline is that people are allowed to be anonymous and private and share things with you without, without that information. Um, statute of limitations, Allison, is different in, in a number of, it, it depends. It depends on where it happened, how old they were, you know, those different kinds of things. Um, so they can pursue there, you know what, there isn't any statute of limitations anymore on adults uh, around the legal, uh, criminal legal system. That ended uh, in 2019 session. Civil, though, there is a statute of limitations to do civil uh, processes. <clears throat> yep, there's not, Barbara, you're correct. That's new, though, just in the last couple of years. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and I think I have information on, there's just additional information in your legal advocacy section of your um, Dropbox that has just like additional information around legal advocacy, laws, different things like that be in there. Um, yeah, anything else that is, that was left over from there? Go ahead. You want to check us out, Patricia? Sure. So Advocate Core is almost done. One more session. Please in the chat or unmute yourself if you'd like to share one thing you have already integrated into your work or life that you learned in this training so far. Um, this is Sadie. Hi, Sadie. Uh, I already like kind of did this, but now I'm, you know, whenever I have conversations with people now and they're telling me about just their feelings in general, but especially about like vulnerable experiences they have, I'm so much more conscious that I am first and foremost validating their feelings and letting them know, you know, that I'm here to support them 
before I, you know, try to kind of ask questions. I feel like sometimes, I don't know if other people experience this, but at least for me, you know, you kind of want to ask questions first when you hear things from people, you know, you kind of have that investigative instinct. And this training has taught me just that is not the priority, you know, just listen, validate, normalize. And I'm doing that a lot and people appreciate it. So yeah, yeah. I really it's, this training. Yeah, normalizing that is being present. That's being present, right? Because if we're thinking of questions, next questions to ask, we're in our heads. And so that's great. Thanks for sharing. I like Melanie said, learning that silence is okay. I try to listen more. Mm -hmm. um, ben, this is, so, I'm so sorry. This is yep. Barbara. I have a question and I'm going to sound really stupid asking this question because you've been talking about it every day, but I still don't get it. The, the landmark thing. Um, so uh, wanting to identify um, the, the Native American land um, history. I don't understand that. Um, I, I think it's really opened my eyes as far as, you know, the history of the land that was stolen from Native Americans through history, but I don't understand what it is that we do at the very beginning, which is why I've never offered to do it. So I'm so sorry. Anyhow, yes, could you please explain that better for me? We have um, a great article too from the Puyallup Tribe newsletter. Maybe we can forward that to all the participants and that would be very helpful. Um, I don't have it so I can drop it in the chat right now. But um, really, this is me and my opinion. It is changing our own perspective and setting the tone right at the beginning of any gathering um, of accountability. That's about accountability too. And that we are aware of the colonization, the uh, patriarchy, the misogyny, and we're gonna call it out and we're gonna name it. And we are going to have reverence for the people whose land we're on. So, you know, boiling it down, that, that's what I would say, just off the top of my, my brain. But mm -hmm. we do have that week, uh, article we can send, which is from the Puyallup Tribe newsletter. Yes, exactly. Um, it, it's Native American women and people are so much more likely to be sexually assaulted than any other ethnic group, right? So... It, it's, inc it's extra important for those of us that do sexual assault work to acknowledge colonization and those connections to it. And I think that in training, what we've done for a long time is to say, here's how you work with Native American communities. Here's how you work with gay communities. Here's how you work with immigrant communities. Instead of wrapping it all in together because it's all connected that the way we work with individual people depends on individuals but it also is so important for us to understand the history of communities to understand how they might interact with systems or not want to work with systems or you know so we're we're showing that respect at the beginning saying Native American people were here first. And so when we're looking at U.S. history and saying, we have this history of, of sexual violence, we have a rape culture, that it all started there for us in the U.S. Of course, it's a global issue. Um, and, and, you know, in other countries, you know, that looks different, but that's our route here. Then we brought, then we stole people, right, from Africa and brought them here. And there are experience was also that of sexual violence that so so all of these different ways that we're we're just acknowledging the oppression acknowledging 
our history helps us understand individual interactions with systems, inner individual experiences of trauma. Maria says here, learning about trauma and understanding that everyone is different and being aware that everyone responds differently to trauma and different forms of trauma. It's like generational. Saying, generational. Ancestral. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in session three, we talked about some of those things like generational trauma, how Japanese internment changed the family dynamics of Japanese families uh, living in the U.S. after that, right? So um, it's, it's a big question. It's a big conversation, Barbara. Um, so I'll, I'll try to find uh, some different resources like the one from the PL tribe as well and put that together for you all and send it out thank when you, I do. Thank you so much for that question. Yes. That was a very good question. There's so many layers mm -hmm. and um, yeah. Yeah. So thank when you. I, thank you both. Sure. When I send out session eight and when we do our, our final one on Wednesday, um, then we will um, we'll wrap up, but I'll send I'll send some more resources around this as well. And remember, just because, you know, do, do, I hope you're not contracting over our final session is Wednesday. You have our emails. You know how to contact us. We're not going to disappear off the face of the earth. We're here. Mm hmm. All right. So, sorry for the little extra time. Appreciate you sticking around. Take care. <laughs>